to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear this? Yes. Louder. If I get soft during the service. A little bit louder. louder. A little bit louder? There you go. All right. Okay, good. Good morning to everyone. I'm happy to be with you again uh, on this Trinity Sunday, the uh, last of the festival Sundays of the year. Okay. So, um, we have the service before us. Um, we'll begin with our first hymn, Rejoice, O Pilgrim and Throng. <laughs> Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown his mercy to us. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him, because he has shown his mercy to us. <laughs> And I said, 
Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in its hand a burning coal that it had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. <laughs> Second reading is from Acts chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also would dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Satan's, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on a throne, who foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he would not was not abandoned to Hades, nor did the flesh seek corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and, of all of the, and we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this to you, to your yourselves, are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into, he into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. wishes and you hear its sound, 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not <coughs> send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our holy Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. See that we continue with our next hymn.
Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament lesson that we just heard is probably a favorite of a few people, maybe a lot of people. The story of Isaiah and his vision in the uh, temple. I'm going to ask you to take your bulletin and turn over to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. There. That's the first reading. It's on page 3 in your bulletin there. And just look at that as we talk a little bit about what Isaiah saw in the temple. In verse 1, we hear that the story starts with Uzziah in the the year he died. Uzziah had another name, Azariah. And the story of Uzziah is, is a story that has a lot of instruction for all of us. But the center of attention now is what happened in the year that Uzziah died. In the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So God takes Isaiah in a vision into the place where no man should go except the high priest, and that once a year. God meets in that place with the high priest, and in that way is meeting with the people of Israel. But don't make any mistake. God is not a God who just sits by and on his throne and watches things. As we look into and see the vision, we see that his robe is filling that place where he is, is, is in the vision. And it's just like the robe, the vision, the robe is flowing and flowing and keeps filling the thing. God is not a static God that sits there and does nothing. God is in movement. God is in activity. And it's Jesus says, my Father works, and I also work. God is movement. There is motion there. And no mistake, don't make any mistake about it, because heaven is not going to be a static place where people sit and get bored and bounce around on clouds. Heaven is in the presence of God, and there is movement, there is activity, because God is activity and works. So here we have the picture of the king on the throne, the exalted throne. God meets his people in this very, very small place, relatively speaking. But yet, God, the, the, the earth and the heavens are not large enough to hold him. The great God can come down and meet people in his holy place. Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And there you have more movement. In God's realm, all is movement. There's nothing that isn't doing something or something happening. Not that people are getting, not that everybody gets tired, but there is movement, there is life, there is activity. And these angels, the seraphim, they fly. They move from here and there, doing God's bidding all the time. These are creatures, the seraphim, the seraphim and the cherubim. And because they are creatures, they don't put themselves on a level with God. So, aside from the two wings with which they fly, they have two other wings with which they cover their eyes so as not to challenge God and give the idea we're looking at an equal. They're humble. They also are modest. They are also pure. And so they cover the parts below with two wings. They are different than the people that are on the outside of this uh, temple place. The people that are cursing and swearing, rebelling against God, and doing all class of evil. Shameless, arrogant idolaters. But that's not the seraphim that are in the temple in their movement. Verse 3. 
And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of their glory. And that's the theme that they have. That's the theme of their existence. Speaking about their creator, the one who made them and gave life to them and to all things. They are holy. They were without sin. God has no limits. He is not like the seraphim who are limited. God has no limits, but he is also, but he is separate from sin. That means sin doesn't come to him and he doesn't go to sin. In this tabernacle where Jesus is in the temple, again, he is where, where the Lord is in the temple. There he is, uh, his glory is filling the earth at the same time that he is in that temple. No one can see him and know him except the ones to whom he is revealed. But he fills the whole earth with his glory. His, the whole earth is his. He made it. But yet he can come into his creation as he does. And you hear the angels say these words, holy, 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 which means separate from sinners. And you probably think of the words now when you're holy, 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 you think of the words of Matthew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Three holies, three persons. The angels in the temple are worshipers. And they are proclaiming the Lord, the name of the Lord, holy, holy, holy. Verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Seraphim are powerful and active, and at their movement and at their voice, things tremble. The smoke that appears in the tabernacle reminds us that God cannot be known by all people. God hides himself in darkness and reveals himself when he wants to reveal himself to his people. The smoke also speaks to the truth that while God is not available for everyone, cannot be seen by everyone, he invites his people to offer their prayers as incense in the sacrifice. So he is distant from them in the sense that he is hidden. But he is also available to them in, them in the sense that he hears their prayers and invites them to pray. Verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. No man can see God and live. And Isaiah knows this. Because Isaiah knows that he is a sinner. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. And he's not alone. Because he lives among people with unclean lips. And what is happening in Judah at this time is the beginning of paganism. People are leaving the holy, holy, holy one. They are abandoning him. And they start worshiping other gods. They go to the statues of the other gods and kiss the statues. Their lips betray them, for what's in their heart comes out through their lips. Also, they lie, they cheat, they murder, they kill their children, they offer them in sacrifice. They are totally corrupt, a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah also says, I also am a person of unclean lips. Because Isaiah has not always watched that he was always speaking the truth. He didn't always consider what he said, whether it was useful to speak. And he didn't always say, is it necessary for me to speak? And so he being a man of unclean lips also is a person who cannot come unto God. And so he trembles and shakes and says, I'm an undone person. I am lost. I will be destroyed. 
verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. So Isaiah, the man of unclean lips, the sinner, is in the right place in order to receive the right thing. Because in the tabernacle, in the temple, there are the sacrifices instituted by Moses at God's command. There is purification in the temple. Purification through the shedding of blood, where Christ the Savior is announced ahead of time, but also a purification through burning. And so the angel, the seraphim, comes to Isaiah with a, a coal from the fire in the temple. He brings purification to sinful man, verse 7. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The specific atonement, the specific purification is applied to the specific sin and error to the mouth. Because he is a man of unclean lips, that needs to be clean. Men, mankind, need all kind of cleaning, not just in the mouth, but in the hands, touching things and feeling things and taking things that don't belong to them. Um, with the eyes, they need purification in the eyes, looking at things, lusting after things. In their feet, they should be cleaned in their feet, running after evil, running after false gods, running after things that don't count. There is purification needed for all of men, the whole man, the whole person. But here is emphasized the lips. And so in the temple, by a prophecy toward Christ, who will come and purge away, be propitiation for the sins of the world, <laughs> the sin of Isaiah is taken away when the coal touches his lips in this vision. And that reminds us of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Isaiah needs it. And the holy, holy, holy in the tabernacle provides just what he said, what he needs. Verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? The Lord says, Who shall I send? And then he says, Who shall go for us? Because there is one God, but God himself speaks of us. There is one God, but there is holy, holy, holy. God's will for his creation, the will of the holy, holy, holy for his creation is, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, that's what the Bible is talking about. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And so there is a purification unto life given in by the holy, holy, holy. And this purification is sent to others. The holy, holy, holy says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Because all around the tabernacle, all around Israel, all around the Mideast, all around the whole world, there are people of unclean lips, which demonstrate an unclean heart, unclean lips through which the fruits of the heart flow, robbery, deceits, adulteries, corruptions of all time. But God wants to be the God, the holy, holy, holy wants to be the God of all people. So he sends them a purification. And the purification looks forward to Christ. And for right now, uh, Isaiah is the one who goes. He's been cleansed, and now he wants to proclaim what the Lord sends, tells him to do. So Isaiah goes out, and in his book, in his speaking, for the rest of his life, he will talk about what the Holy, Holy, Holy has to say to him. He will say to the people, Behold, 
A virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And he will also say, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Prince, a mighty God, Prince of Peace, and he will rule and govern. And he will also say to the people, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so the Holy, Holy, Holy sends out Isaiah, the first of many messengers. This happens 700 years before God sends into the world his only begotten Son. And the, whole, the only begotten Son of God is also holy, holy, holy. And He wants to send out as well. So He sends out His disciples. And you know the word. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. From all of this, we're directed in a certain way. Isaiah was sent, but his being sent was only a prelude to the great sending that God would do when the Father sends the Son. And then when the Father and the Son, at the promise of the Son, send the Holy Spirit upon the disciples and upon the earth and on the, on the people, that great sending. So that the people who are unclean, who have an unclean lips because of their idolatry, because of their, their, their language, because of their desires, because of their corruption and greed, that through the gospel message, they can be cleansed and purified from their sins. God's Son enters human flesh and becomes the propitiation for the sins of the world. In this way, unclean people receive the word of life and have life and live in God forever through the resurrection of the dead to eternal life. So there's a great sending. We see that. The work of purification and salvation is a work that is carried out by the Trinity. The Father is involved. The Son is involved. The Holy Spirit is involved. The Holy, Holy, Holy is involved. In our church, we started out in Christmas, at Christmas, talking about the incarnation of the Son, how God sent His Son into the world. Then, we moved along to Epiphany, and we talked about how the Son of God was manifested to be true God in the flesh. Then we got into Lent, and we talked about how the Son of God taking our sins upon himself, suffered abandonment by God so that we might have reconciliation with God. And then we talked about the ascension of the resurrection of Jesus, how God showed that Christ had done his work and has raised him from the dead. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And then we talk about ascension, how Jesus was taken up so that the disciples would no longer have his visible presence there. He remained with them, but they could not see him. And then we get to Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is poured out over the disciples so that they are able to go out like Isaiah and proclaiming the good news of the Holy, Holy, Holy. But now, the Holy, Holy has, holy has been revealed because Jesus has revealed him. The holy, holy, holy is only revealed through Jesus Christ. Without Christ, there is no knowledge of the true God. And the disciples take this knowledge of Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit go out and preach reconciliation with the Father through the Son and through faith that is given to people by the Holy Spirit. We tend to think in Christ alone. That's correct. Christ alone is our salvation. 
but we don't always remember that the whole Trinity, the whole holy, 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 is involved in our salvation. God is not a God who only partially helps his people. God is a God who fully helps his people. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity, the Trinity is a hard word. It's a word that isn't in the Bible. But everything that's expressed by the word Trinity that we emphasize today on Trinity Sunday is from the Bible. What does the Trinity mean? It means there's one God, but there are three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But there aren't three gods, only one God, as just we say in the Athanasian Creed. Then, the Father is all-powerful, the Son is all-powerful, and the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. But there aren't three all-powerfuls, there's one all-powerful, as we also say in the nice, or the, in the Athanasian Creed. We confess one God in three persons. We don't have to use the word persons, we don't have to use the word trinity. Those words are used to help explain the, the trinity. But all we have the words of the scripture which say Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And there's only one God, but three persons. Trinity is a hard word and it was used, it wasn't used in the Bible, and even in the first two creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, it's not used. But in the Athanasian Creed, there it is, the word Trinity. Augustine, St. Augustine used that word. But just imagine what's happening here. As the Christian church moved out of Israel up to Europe, barbarians came into the, into the area, and they need to be instructed because they had no understanding of God. And so in order to explain what God was, what the Trinity was, the Athanasian Creed was written. It explains one God, three persons. Take a long time to explain it. Then it explains, the Son of God became a human being for us and for our salvation. So that was how the early church, or the church about 400 after Christ, explained the true God to the barbarians. There is only salvation in the triune God, in the Holy Trinity. There is no salvation outside of Him. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son reveals the Father. And so the teaching was very important. Today we live in a world that is full of barbarians. Fifty years ago we wouldn't say that. But now we say our world is full of barbarians. The barbarians are surrounding the church. I'm not going to say that house or that house. But there are barbarians all over the place. Our state wanted to introduce abortion up to nine months infanticide, something that the pagans did in olden days. Our state wanted to corrupt and cut up the bodies of children so that they could be what they wanted to be. How barbaric. Our state wanted to propose physician-assisted suicide. What a barbaric thing. Our state wants to throw aside all moral principles. What a barbaric thing. And we are in the middle of that. But in the midst of this church, in this congregation, is the holy, holy, holy. The only way of salvation. There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus, who reveals the true God to us. The existence of this church is very important because in a barbaric world, where will people hear about the true God? The true God who gave of himself in order to save people. So out of this congregation comes a confession. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father who created us, the Son who redeems us, and the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us 
so that we believe and have salvation through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. And believing this, we are assured that we will finally be taken out of this barbaric world and through the resurrection of the dead. When Jesus comes, calls an end to the things of this world, raises the dead and gives to his, his believers eternal life in Jesus Christ and the new heaven and the new earth. All of this is the work of the Trinity. And so we need to understand what this Trinity is and appreciate it more and more all the time. We sing about it all the time in our church services, Trinitarian. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, holy, 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 and we'll see it more in the communion liturgy. But to understand and remember how important this is, and important that we continue confessing the faith in the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so as we end sermons, we normally, in this way, we do it again today. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge, that we may glorify you forever. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, Matthew, our Synod President, and our District President, our Circuit Visitor, and our Pastors, we hear your voice calling, um, calling uh, them to be your servants. Grant to them the Spirit so that they can always say, Here am I, send me, to, quit, to whatever you ask. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord of hosts, you delivered up your Son according to your definite plan and for knowledge to be our Savior. Make our hearts glad in this faith, that our tongues may rejoice and our flesh may dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, since your Son will shatter kings when he executes judgments on the nations, keep our governor, our president, and all our leaders from acting in ways that will earn them his wrath. Bless them with wisdom to govern us in accord with your righteous ways. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord of hosts, we thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifices of those who served faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and in the defense of our land. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord of hosts, Uphold all who suffer in our midst by your truth, that since you are there at their right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord of hosts, take away our guilt and atone for our sin by touching our unclean lips with Christ's cleansing body and blood, that we may not be lost, but abide in your holy presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. 
gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory and honor and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give your thanks and grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, <laughs>